morning and uh, stand with you, with me, if you would, please, the reading of God's holy word. And Jesus told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while, he refused. But afterward, he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down with her continual coming. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find that faith on earth? Since the reading of God's inerrant word, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the word upon which we choose to build our lives. We pray that you will help us this morning to understand this section just a little better and that it will inform the way that we live in the weeks to come. Thank you that you are patient with us and when we fail, you unerringly forgive as we ask you to forgive as we confess our sins as you ask us to do. And we confess them this morning, Father. We are intolerant. We are, we are often, um, we are often, Father, backwards when it comes to sharing the gospel with others for whatever reason, because we are afraid that we will be thought different, uneducated. Lord, I just pray that you will Thank you for your patience with us, and I pray that you will instill on us, Lord, a, such, a, such a love for you that the rest of it is immaterial. Be with those who are our designated um, representatives in far places of the earth. Pray for Bob and Jan Springer this morning as they make your word known in various ways through technology and through the preparing of ways for the Bible to be heard and the word to be heard over radio signals around the world. We pray for Bob and Helen Cortheis as they make your word known through helping purchase these houses and put families in them, foster families for children, young people who would never otherwise have the opportunity to hear about you. Pray for those who are being persecuted in hard places. We ask that you will build them up that you will encourage them, that you will give them the words when the time comes, that you will not allow any of their pain to be in vain, that you will, Lord, in your own time and in your own way, release them. Those that you choose to take home through martyrdom, will you give them special measure of your grace? And again, we pray that the purposes which you have will be worked out live in an evil world, Father, but we thank you that we have a loving and kind and generous Father who will not only put an end to all of that one day, but will judge fairly and justly. So we thank you that we belong to you, and we pray that you will use this day and this time for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated, and if you have not already, please turn with us to Luke 18. 18th chapter of Luke. It's an old rhyme that goes something like this. It says, his wisdom is sublime, his heart profoundly kind, God never is before his time and never is behind. That's a good truth to live by. But to the disciples, as we come to this part of the book of Luke, there is great concern that he is behind. It sort of looks that way. He's already informed them that as they move toward Jerusalem, toward what they fully anticipated would be the establishment of his earthly kingdom, that that is not what's going to happen. 
When they arrive in Jerusalem, the kingdom will not arrive on their schedule. It will be delayed as a result of the rejection of the nation, and in fact, he will be killed. He'll be persecuted and killed, and then he will rise again on the third day. It will be a huge unmet expectation. So what should they do in light of that, this news that he's given them at the end of chapter 17? Well, he tells them at the, end of, or at the beginning of chapter 18, here's what you should do. You should not lose heart, number one, as you see hard things come. Do not lose heart. And number two, you should pray. You should pray. Literally, he says then in verse 8, if I come again, will I find this faith on earth? Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find literally that faith on earth, the faith that holds on, the faith that does not lose heart, the faith that prays faithfully, faith that does not take current events as the final answer. Faith that does not believe that adversity means loss, not in an ultimate sense. People living, in other words, faithfully in a faithless world. That's what the Lord is looking for now and when he comes again. So the instruction, negatively, do not lose heart. Positively, pray. And now he's going to tell us, why to do that? Why to pray? And by the way, it's not what most people think. I'm, I'm going to guess most of you have heard a sermon on this parable will have heard it a little differently than you will hear it this morning. This is one of those cases where, you, where I trust that uh, as those who teach will receive double condemnation, double judgment, that what I share with you is right, but I firmly believe it is. Most of you, if you have this parable in the Bible would have a word written right across the whole thing that says persistence. It's generally taught that that is what this parable is about. It's about persistence in prayer. People point to the widows continually coming, for example, in verse 5. To the believers crying to God day and night in verse 7. And they conclude the issue is persistence. If you want answers, you must overcome God's reluctance. You must be persistent in your prayers. This is the way you get attention. God doesn't really want to be bothered or he doesn't want to answer my prayers and therefore I must persist and persist and, 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 and be pesky until he finally gives in. Plead long and hard enough and your desire will be yours. That is not what this parable is teaching. Persistence in prayer is a good thing. I do not want to discourage you from having persistence in prayer. Persistence is a necessary thing. But that is not the main point here. Most of the parables in the Bible are parables of comparison. In other words, they are saying, this is this way and this other thing is very similar to that. The two are compared to each other. This is one of, a few, I think just one of two parables in the Bible that are parables of, of instead of comparison, that are, that are parables of contrast. This parable is saying, if this happens this way, you can be sure this is going to happen just exactly the opposite. It's a parable of contrast. And when you understand that, the parable will make much more sense, I think, to you. If this is a parable of comparison, if that's what it is, then we are like this rejected, unloved woman who must ask and ask and plead. And God is like this reluctant, unrighteous judge. And the only way to get something is to basically nag it out of him. That's not what the parable is teaching at all. It is a parable of contrast. And Jesus' point is not that just like this un unwanted woman who got results from an unrighteous judge by nagging and nagging that we must do the same to get responses from an unresponsive God by our persistence. And so our persistence becomes really the idol. Our persistence becomes the key. That is not what he's teaching. It's not the point at all. That would be a parable of comparison. But God is not an unrighteous judge. And we are not unwanted, unloved intrusions, just the opposite. So Jesus' point here is if that unwanted, unloved, 
rejected woman could get results from that guy, that evil guy, who is reluctant to give her anything, how much more can we who are loved beyond expression expect answers for a God who lives to answer our prayers? That's the point. It's a parable of contrast. It's not about persistence in prayer. It is confidence in prayer that is teaching. Martin Luther said it well. He said, prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance. It is laying hold of God's willingness. That's what prayer is. So two points illustrate this under that. First of all, you are received, not rejected. You are received, not rejected when you pray. Verse three, there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. Widowhood, as most of you are probably aware, was, it, would, it would have been the greatest example that Jesus could have come up with of those who are the most vulnerable, the least able to help themselves in that society. When a woman became a widow, it was a serious situation. There was no welfare state to help her in those days. There was no one to step in and say, here, we'll take care of you. It was whatever she could get from her family, from her parents if they were still alive, from any siblings if she had any, or from her children if they would still pay attention to her and were old enough to do so. But a widow who had no family was absolutely on her own. She would have had no recourse but to be on the streets begging. Furthermore, a woman in those days had no standing at court. She would not be allowed to give testimony in court. Women were not allowed to bring a case in court except in very extraordinary circumstances. And in the case of, a, of an unrighteous judge like that, this, like, like is listed here, that only means one thing. That means a bribe. And she certainly had no money to do that. So she's a, like a three-time loser. She can't come to court on her own. She has no man to come to court on her behalf. And she has no money to pay a bribe. She was alone, she was helpless, and she was desperate. That's the picture that Jesus has presented here. That's the woman that he has invented to make his point. So what does she do? She pesters him to death. She pesters him to death. She, verse three, she kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. To the point that the judge finally says in verse five, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down with her continued coming. Beat me down is an interesting word. It's literally give me a black eye. Now, it doesn't mean that she was literally striking out at him or hitting him physically, but mentally, she certainly was. She was pestering him to death. Now, she wasn't doing this in court. He would have had her thrown out before she could say anything, right? This all had to be taking place outside of court. But the point is, every time he turned around outside of court, there she was. He tries to go to the market, there she is. He has lunch with a colleague and comes out and there she is. He tries to leave his home and go somewhere, there she is after him all the time. Give me justice, please help me, do something for me. Get me out of this trouble. To the point where he finally, after all the pleading, he finally says, I can't take it anymore. I will give you justice. That's the picture. Now the woman in this parable clearly represents believers, right? She's, she, is, she is the stand-in for those who are followers of Christ. And she is like us in this regard. She is pleading and we should be always praying. That's what Jesus has just said. She's an illustration of that. She is without justice. We, without God's help, are without justice or the ability to bring kingdom justice to this world. But, well, she's like us in that sense. She's absolutely unlike us in the sense that, that she is unloved and unwanted and rejected and we are of the, all the people in the world the most loved, the most wanted, and the most unrejected. 
Look what Jesus says in verse 7. Will not God give justice to his elect? Not to those who are the most pesky. Not to those who are the most persistent, although the persistence is good, but to those who are his elect. He's drawing a, comp- he's drawing a contrast. If this rejected, unwanted woman could finally find justice from this unjust judge, how much more were those who are elect by God find justice from him? They are wanted. They are loved. They are embraced by God. You, you want to know how much you want to know how much you are loved and embraced by God? Turn, turn with me to Ephesians. Some of you, a few of you may have been here way back when we were in Ephesians 1, you laugh. I remember it. <laughs> Ephesians 1, do you remember this passage? Such a wonderful passage. Ephesians 1, Paul, Paul is so struck in this passage. You know, verses, verses 3 through 14 of Ephesians 1, it's all one sentence in the original language. All one sentence. He gets going and he can't stop. He is probably dictating this to an amanuensis, a guy who is taking the note, you know, and trying to write and trying to keep up with him as he goes through this. But listen to what he says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ. That's how much you're loved. You're not an unwanted, rejected, bothersome person to God when you come to pray. You are welcome. You are as welcome as your little child, you know, that's whatever, 13 months old, just beginning to walk. Maybe they haven't quite got to that point and they come and they want to come and sit in your lap. I mean, how good is that, right? They want to come and be with you for a little bit. This is God. This is how he views us when we come to the throne of grace and prayer. We are not unwanted or rejected. We are wanted beyond anything. I think of David Platt in one of his books, I don't remember which one, but he talks about how he used to holler across the room at his son, Caleb, and he used to holler across the room, Caleb, daddy loves Caleb. And Caleb would holler back at him and he'd say, Caleb loves daddy. Just a little thing they had going on, right? One day he hollered across the room and he says, daddy loves Caleb. And instead of answering the way he usually did, Caleb looked at him and it was like the, you know, the, the wheels were beginning to turn. And he said, why? why? Why do you love me? He said, Caleb, I love you because you're my son. And you know how the why questions go, right? They never stop. So he says, well, you're, you're my son. And he says, why? Well, if you've read the illustration, you remember that David Platt remembered back to all the pain and suffering and toil they had gone through to adopt this young man from Kazakhstan. Some of you in this audience have had the privilege and the pain of going through the adoption process in some foreign place. As he was thinking back on that, he said, tears came to his eyes and he said, son, he said, you're our son because we wanted you. We came to get you so that you could have a mommy and a daddy. Doesn't it take your breath away to think that God says the same thing to you and to me? You're the son or the daughter of God. He says he has in love predestined us to adoption as children of God. You never, ever, ever come to the throne of God as an unwanted intrusion that cannot happen. You are received. You are not rejected. And so we come not to overcome God's reluctance, but to lay hold of his willingness. Secondly, back in Luke, God is righteous. 
not reluctant. The judge in this case obviously represents God, says that he is an unrighteous man. He feared, he didn't fear God, neither did he respect those who came before him. He had only one interest in life and that was himself. He was after number one and whatever he could do to feather his own nest. Is that, in, is that a comparison to show us what God is like? Or is that a contrast? To say this is what that guy was like and she managed to get relief from him anyway. What can you expect from a God who loves you infinitely? From a God who is righteous and a God who is just. God is just the opposite of this scoundrel. And so while he may seem reluctant or distant or indifferent at times, he never is. You gotta get this in your mind. I have to get this in my mind. God sometimes seems like he is just, where is he? I don't know where I can find him. But he's never missing. There are always reasons beyond our ability to comprehend that God sometimes holds back. He is perhaps exercising discipline in our life that is much needed according to Hebrews 12. He may be distant from our life because of spiritual warfare going on that has nothing to do with us according to Daniel 10. You'll find it there. He may be doing this to increase our dependence on him according to Job 13, which we all need far more of. He may using, be using it to grow us, to get rid of the excess in our life and to be left with just the gold that he wants to find according to Job 23. I mean, you could go on and on. There are thousands of reasons why God may choose for a period of time to be absent or to appear to be reluctant or even to answer prayer differently than we think. But God is always there and he is always good and he always does the best thing for. He is not the reluctant, unrighteous judge. He is the righteous, willing father. We're going to, next year, we're going to celebrate the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, right? And we're going to remember the day when Luther tacked those 95 theses to the wall in Wittenberg. He had no idea that he was starting a Reformation, did he? He was just trying to object to the fact that the church was putting itself and its authority above the authority of the Word of God. And that's the point he wanted to make. But of course, he immediately, it, Im it immediately struck a problem with the church at the time, the Roman Catholic Church. They hated that thought because their whole authority was based on the fact that the church has equal or even more authority than the Bible, has more because it has the, the authority to interpret the Bible. And Luther was saying, no, every man is a priest and every man has the right to interpret Scripture himself, the Bible was written for people and so they hated him. And so Cardinal Cajetan, who was in his area, was sent to pay him off. They said, let's just give him some money and we'll have him stop this nonsense that he's going through. And Cajetan came back and reported, this fool doesn't love gold. He won't take it. Can't pay him off. And so they sent him back with another message and he came back to Luther and he said, don't you realize that the Pope's little finger is stronger than all of Germany? Do you think the German princes are going to come to your aid and defend you, you wretched worm? They used stuff like that in those days. Didn't really mean anything, it's just the way they talked. He said, no, they won't. And he said, and then where will you be? Luther looked him square in the eye and he said, I'll tell you where I'll be. I'll be the same place I've always been. I'll be in the hands of God. It's a good place to be. That's why Jesus is urging, don't lose heart, but pray. Because when we pray, what are we doing? We're, we're putting ourselves in the hands of God, beloved. We're putting our hands, ourselves in the hands, not of a reluctant, unrighteous judge. We're putting ourselves in the hands of a, in an infinitely loving, infinitely patient, infinitely kind, infinitely willing God. That's faithful living in a faithless world. So that's why we should not lose heart and we should pray. 
But then Jesus wraps this parable up with one more thing, and that is what to expect, what to expect. Why hold on to that faith? That faith that believes in God no matter what the circumstances. And he gives two just really great promises. It says in verse seven, will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. I see two things that we can expect when we're living a faithful life in a faithless world. Justice and peace. Sounds like a law firm, doesn't it? But justice and peace are two things that we can expect. So let's look at these. Justice, first of all, I love this promise. This is the assurance we have that someday God will right every wrong. I think about that for a moment. God will right every, think of every wrong you can think of that's ever happened in the world that you're aware of, that you've read about, that you've heard about, that you can imagine. God's gonna right every wrong, one of them. Beloved, I, I don't know how. He's going to write every one of them. God's going to heal every wound. God will one day vindicate every act of faith. Why? Because that's who he is. That's his nature. Do you remember when Abraham found out that God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? Remember that? And he, and he knew that his nephew Lot was down there in Sodom. And so he's worried, and so he, he goes to God and he begins to pray. And here's the basis of his appeal. It's in, it's in Genesis 18, verse 25. Here's what Abraham said to God. He said, shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? And the expected answer is, of course. That's all he can do. It's his character. He will never do anything unjust. God is just. When Jesus pictures his elect who cry to him day and night, he's not saying, do this. It's not an instruction. It's a description. It's a description of people who are dependent. It's a description of people who realize that apart from God, there will never be justice. We should always be working for it. It should be part of our nature too because as children of God, we should reflect what his nature is because we're part of the family, right? But it will never happen apart from God. And so we should be desperately crying out day and night for this. But it's basically a recognition that those who are living a faithful life and a faithful world, those who are gonna be, they're, they're the people that are gonna be persecuted. They're the people that are gonna be mocked. They're the people that are gonna be thought ill of. They're the people that are gonna be... <coughs> thought hopelessly outdated, thought foolish because they trust in a God that no one can see. They will be persecuted and perhaps even killed. So that's the nature of the people who are trusting God. That's, that's those who have that faith. That's what will happen to them potentially in this life. It happens all the time. That's why the Chap Hebrews chapter 11 talks about how those who believed in God, you know, they got there, they had people come back from the dead and they had these wonderful miracles and they had this and that. And in the same middle of the same verse, it says, and some of them were sawn in two and some had this and that happen. Faith in God doesn't guarantee safety in this life, but it guarantees eternal safety. It guarantees ultimate fa fairness. It guarantees that judgment, justice has to come because the God who will be judging is just. Jesus is saying you will be vindicated. You may be marginalized now, but you will be vindicated in the end. You may be mocked and ostracized and thought stupid and kept on the outside looking in now. But the time is coming when God will make it all right. Psalms chapter nine, verse 18, David says this, for the needy shall not always be forgotten and the hope of the poor shall not perish forever. Why are those things true? Because if you back up to Psalm nine, verse eight, it says, and he judges the world with righteousness. He judges the peoples with uprightness. That's the God we serve. He cannot, by virtue of who he is and by virtue of his character, he cannot ever let any 
smallest thing going accounted for, but that justice will be made right. Listen, that's, I mean, we, we love that when we think about other people, but that would be a warning to us too, right? We have a tendency every day to think unjustly about other people, to act unjustly toward other people. God will judge us just like he does everyone else. A day of reckoning is coming. But he will make every wrong right that we suffer in this life. The temporary shame of those who love God will become the permanent shame of those who turn against him. So hang on. Paul gives a vivid description of this in 2 Thessalonians. Just listen to it as I read it. But 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6, he says, this is the evidence of the righteous judgment of God. Here's the evidence. The righteous judgment of God. That you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering. Since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you. Payback will come. And to grant relief to you who are afflicted, as well as to us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel. At the very latest, it will all be made right then. Vindication is coming, young people. You need to know as the unbelievers laugh at you at school, as the teachers mock your faith, if, as, you, as you take your stand for Christ, exoneration will come. The character of the God you serve guarantees it. You know, God tested Job under some horrendous situations, right? Circumstances that we all probably fall pretty fast on. Imagine losing all your family, all, everything you own all at one time. He was mocked by those who thought his faith was in vain, those who were supposed to be his friends. His own wife told him, why don't you just curse God and die? But you know, without ever answering the why question, because it's, there isn't, that answer isn't in the book of Job, other than we know, we know at the beginning of the book why. But Job is never told why. Without ever answering that question, God just says basically, trust me. Trust me. And he, said, and, and he basically says, you think you, you think you have even the right to ask the question? Okay, let me ask you a few. Where were you when I created the world? Where were you when I laid it all out? Why do you think you can go up against me to even ask the question? And don't get me wrong, God doesn't mind you asking why, but beloved, you can't stay there. Very, you can't live there. How did it all end for Job? Job 42, verse 12. And the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, 1,000 female donkeys. He also had seven sons and three dollars. You check it out, what you'll find out is God doubled everything that he had at the beginning. He doubled it at the end. Everything was kids. Still only had seven sons and three daughters, new ones, which, he, which is what he started out with. Now, I know some of you think, well, that's because God didn't want didn't to undo him too much. Seven and three is enough. But of course, that's not the answer. The answer is he already had 10 of them in heaven. So he had double the number of kids as well. He had double everything. What's the point God is making? God vindicates his faithful followers, not always in this life, not always immediately, though sometimes, not always when we would like it, but vindication is coming because God is God and because God is righteous and because God is good. He's infinitely fair. So justice is coming. We say, okay, that's great, and that's fine, but what about, what about this speed thing? You said there's two things, justice and speed. I want to know about speed. Verse 8, I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. And take, Greek word, soon, or better, as soon as possible. Expect speed. 
See, that's where faith usually goes down the drain. Because we read that and we see that, hey, justice is coming fast and Jesus said that, but we don't see it speedily. Despair and doubt begin to take over. We're living, before we know it, a faithless life in a faithless world because mm, I don't see the justice and I certainly don't see the speed, what's happened. To us, the word speedily means now, right? Speedily means now, today, Okay, tomorrow latest. That would be speedily. It can mean that. The words which are used here mean that. And for example, in Acts chapter 12, verse 8, you may remember Peter got arrested as after Jesus had ascended and the church was just getting underway. Peter got arrested. He was thrown in jail because, because Herod had killed James. The apostle James and the religious elite loved that, so he thought, I'll just ingratiate myself. I'm going to get Peter too. And he put him in jail and he was going to kill him. But an angel appeared to Peter in jail that night and he said, get up quickly. Same word as in, in our verse in Luke 18, verse 8. Get up quickly, he says in Acts 12, verse 8. And he didn't mean tomorrow. It mean next week, he meant now. So sometimes the word means right now. But usually the term has a broader meaning. Usually a broader meaning. For example, in Revelation 1.1, I think you started this in the Sunday school class today. I don't know if you got to the second word in Revelation 1 because Jesse's teaching it, but wherever you got... You got somewhere. I say that in, in, with respect. Where are you, Jesse? So I, well, are we still friends? Um, he's no worse than I am. Revelation 1.1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon and take, take place. Well, have all the things in the book of Revelation taken place? I don't think so. And yet, God said they'd be soon. Soon. What does he mean? He means as soon as possible, beloved. He means as soon as all the pieces of the puzzle are ready. He means as soon as the ingredients have all been put together and it's ready to go. That's what he means by soon, as soon as possible. Same thing in Romans 16, verse 20. Paul closes off the letter to the Romans by saying this, the God of all peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. That's a promise that was issued 2,000 years ago. I don't think that's happened yet, right? Satan isn't crushed under our feet yet. It hasn't happened yet, but it will. It will soon. When? Soon? How soon? As soon as possible. As soon as possible. That's how we must read this. Speedily. Speedily means as soon as possible. You see, 2,000 years to me is not speedy, right? Not to you, not to any of us here this morning. But see, to God, 2,000 years, we've already discovered it last week, is so like two days, right? It's nothing. To a God who actually exists outside of time, it's nothing. So the definition of speedily in Luke 18, 8 is actually, it's actually found in that verse. He says, will he, that is God, delay? Will he delay long over his elect? Will he delay? And the grammatically expected answer to that question is no, he will not do that. He will not delay. What, what Jesus is saying there is God will never delay beyond the moment that justice can be done. That's why sometimes it's in this life and sometimes it's gonna be in the life to come. But, but, but here's the point. Speedily means justice is going to come just as soon as it can happen, just as soon as it's possible, just as soon as it fits the plan of God. He will not allow you or me or anyone else to suffer one iota of a second beyond what's necessary. Do you see that? That's what he's promising. That's what soon means. It means you're not going to have one moment beyond what has to be endured in order for his greater plan to be accomplished. That's what soon means. There will be no extension of adversity beyond what is necessary 
We will one day understand that. We will one day see that what God did was right, that we, what, what we'd have wanted would have been wrong. We will one day be able to see what would have come if it had gone our way. Soon, as soon as possible. To accomplish his purposes. You tell your kids we're going to Disneyland soon. I promise you, they have a different definition of that word than you do. Right? We're going soon. To them it means today, tomorrow latest. Right? You understand, whoa, man, I made that promise. Now I got to get tickets to Disneyland. I got to get airline tickets. I got to find a hotel out there somewhere. I got to arrange for time off work. Soon could be months. Could be years in some cases. I got to save the money up. If you've been there, you know what I mean, right? As soon as possible. In a small way, that's what God is saying here. And meantime, what's going on with them? They love you, but they keep asking, don't they? They keep pestering, don't they? They believe you, they trust you, but they keep asking. That's what, that's what Jesus is asking. He's pointing, they don't think you don't love them because you don't go today or tomorrow. They trust you. They love you. They just want it to happen. Don't we want it to happen? Is that why we go back to what we said last week? What, how are we praying? Your kingdom come, your will be done. Let, let it become your heart cry for that. But in the meantime, trust a God who says, I will give you justice and I will give it soon. Let me close with one example. Changing my whole closing here, so I hope I get this right. But, the, but I, I want to take you to a guy who would have had reason to think soon didn't look quite like that. Remember how God gave a promise to Abraham? Gave him a promise. And he said, I'm going to make you a great nation and I'm going to bless all the people of the world through you and I'm going to give you a, a country. And... Ten years on, there were no children. And Abraham is getting, he knows he and both, both he and his wife, because now they're, he's 85, she's 75. They're getting close to the end of childbearing years. And so Sarah says, well, why don't you just take my handmaid? And it's a custom of the time. You can have a child by her and it'll be your child and everything will be good. And so that's what he did. And they got Ishmael, remember that? Their fleshly effort. And he represents flesh, and so they had this child. And uh, later on, Genesis 17, Abraham cried, God comes and he promises Abraham, hey, listen, I'm going to be back next year at this time. Now, this is 14 years later. God shows up. Abraham thinks he's had the kid for 14 years, 13, I guess, nine months gestation period. Thinks he's had the right kid. As far as he's concerned, God says, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to keep my promise to you. It's been 24 years now since he made the promise. I'll keep my promise. I'll be back next year and you're going to have this child. Abraham says, what? Are you kidding me? Don't you understand? I can't have children and my wife can't have children. But I got Ishmael here. Let Ishmael live before you. Come on. We had you covered, God. For 14 years, we've had it done. God says, no, I'll be back next year. And next year, all, all human expectation aside, here came Isaac. And the promised son arrived. But I love how God describes this in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 14. Hebrews 6, 14. Well, I'm starting in verse 13. God says there, For when God had made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to, by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, here's the part I really love. Hebrews 6, verse 15. Thus Abraham, having patiently waited. <laughs> Give me a break. <laughs> patiently waited. Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. Listen, we're like children with God. We are not very patient.
sometimes we must wonder when we look at our own lives, is God gonna find that faith when he comes to earth? Will he? Does he find that kind of faith in me? Beloved, vindication is coming. Every right will be wronged. Everything will come out the way it's supposed to, but we need to be those who are praying, who are like the children, who are saying to a God who loves us because we are also loved, Lord, would you please let your kingdom come, let your will be done. And amazingly, despite our impatience, God counts it to us as patience. That's the gospel. That's the grace of God. That's why we should rejoice, is it not? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word. Thank you for your wonderful patience with us. But Lord, help us to understand this parable that Jesus has given us to remind us how loved we are, to remind us how loving you are, to tell us if that unwanted, rejected woman could get, could finally get justice from this unrighteous, unloving, reluctant judge, if that could happen in that case, how much more will we be taken care of? And so we pray for your kingdom to come. We pray for your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray, Father, for you to give us the patience to trust you to rest in you, to love you, and to serve you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.